Thanks. Hey, everyone, and thanks so much for being here, Shalom. It's so fun to have you virtually in Albany. Um, yeah, that's what you said. Hey, your new office looks pretty cool. I know, it looks pretty snazzy. I literally just moved in. I was, up until now, I was in this uh, very romantic kind of warehouse-y um, space right by some train tracks and with like, everyone brought their pets and I thought it was going to be awesome and it was horrible. It was, like the, it was like the only cold place in Los Angeles. Now, now I'm in one of these like we work -y type of rental spaces, so... We work, by the way. There's a story. Yeah, yeah. I only know it vaguely. Started, then did well, then failed. But I think that's all the story. And the uh, the the sort of Spengali guy, you know, he like took refuge in Tel Aviv. Now, anyway, whatever. Oh, no, really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it's really it's messed up. It's good. Go to Tel Aviv. You would love it. Hate it. Um, I, I, I did that. All right, so. Shalom Auslander, for anybody who doesn't know, um, what's your problem, first of all? Uh, second of all, he's a, he's, okay. he's, he's a hero of mine. Uh, he's also objectively just a great writer. And uh, first book was a collection of stories called Beware of God that blew my young mind. Uh, second book, a memoir, uh, Four Skins Lament. Um, it's fair to say it kind of blew everybody's mind. And uh, then the novel Hope, a Tragedy, uh, in which a struggling writer uh, buys a farmhouse upstate and discovers very elderly Anne Frank living in the attic, uh, working on her second novel, which she's been doing for 70 years uh, with no success. And uh, now we have this novel, came out last fall, Mother for Dinner, a, uh, a just rip-roaring satire of identity politics. Uh, and Shalom also is the creator of Showtime's Happy-ish, which I highly recommend uh, if you are sick of bad TV. <laughs> so, Shalom. Well, you boil uh, everything down into five minutes, it sounds pretty good. <laughs> I could go on and on and on. His work has also appeared in, no. Uh, he's a genius <laughs> who works in many, uh, many different disciplines and is just, uh, we're lucky to have him. In, in this culture, in this language, in this moment in time. Um, Shalom, how does it feel to be completely out of step with um, all uh, trends and, and, and current thinking, always and forever? And, and do you think, uh, what do you think of your very name being Auslander, in fact? Yeah, um, uh, I remember when I wrote for Esquire, they asked me to uh, show me the, my license because they, they were sure it was a pseudonym. Yeah. Um, and I couldn't believe that someone would actually be named that. Um, <laughs> I remember saying, well, if that's, the, if that's the worst thing my parents did to me, that would, I would be in good shape. <laughs> um, uh, Outlander means outsider, for those of you yeah, who know. Yeah, actually, in, I think in German it means get the fuck out. But, get the fuck um, out. <laughs> yeah, but um, uh, yeah, it means you're not from around here. Uh, down south, that's what it means. It's like a word. <laughs> True. Um, so, uh, and then, so there's like peace and out, it doesn't make any sense. It's, mm -hmm. so it's, uh, if it were a pseudonym, it'd be awful. Um, it's not exactly Mark Twain, you know? So, um, but in terms of, like, I, um, I make a very, very concerted effort, you know this, and I, I, I implored you to do the same, which is to just, uh, leave, leave, <laughs> leave the culture leave the internet, leave social media, leave the news. Um, it's, it's no place for a human being. Um, it has nothing to do with reality. It's um, if everything goes perfectly right and good in the world in a hundred years, we'll look back on it and no one's gonna mention COVID, mm -hmm. but they will mention the horror of Twitter and Instagram and um, what, a, what a scourge it's been on humanity. I really do think that. Um, uh, and you can see it, you can see its effects everywhere. Um, um, and you know, there's the occasional sort of like, uh, because it's everywhere, I don't avoid everything. I know, I know enough what's going on. Um, although, I, I mean, I know, I know Trump was awful and I know Biden's helping and I know there was an election and I know there's an illness and 
I know where to get my vaccines and um, but I don't need to know all the horribleness and all the details. I feel like, um, you know, there's this very sort of liberal ideal, and I don't mean liberal politically, but um, of, you know, you have a, a responsibility to be informed and to know things. Um, and first of all, what those things are that we have a responsibility to know is up for debate. I don't think it's the Wall Street Journal. Uh, mm -hmm. I do think it's a library or two. But it feels like, you know, 100 years ago, 200 years ago, it was our job to, uh, or 1,000 years ago, to try and find as many news information as we could. And now it's our job to hide from it. Mm -hmm. It's it's everywhere. It's a tsunami of crap. <laughs> and uh, uh, I was very involved for a long time. I wrote, when I wrote for Esquire, it was about current events. Um, and it just got to me in such a dark way that I shut it all off. And uh, I have to tell you, it's the, one of the most wonderful feelings is going to an airport in America and walking by like Hudson News and seeing all those faces on the front covers of magazines and not knowing who a single fucking one of them is. <laughs> it's victory. Yeah, yeah. You have like a very um, advanced uh, self-protective instinct um, that I have been uh, trying to emulate for a long time without a lot of success, but hope springs eternal. <laughs> That's what you think. Doesn't have to. <laughs> um, yeah. So yeah, you're, I, you're just like, you're, you're out of step. I mean, I feel like you're, and, and, and this book is so, it could not have come along at a better time, uh, I think. Um, slash a worse time because it's about how pointless and destructive identity politics are yeah. um, and how we cling to the past at our own peril and how when we think we're honoring our legacies or upholding tradition what what we're often actually doing is building our own prisons to live inside and die inside alone yeah yeah and um you know interestingly um the book um, uh, got some reviews in the States that were good, um, but most of the, most of the outlets uh, let my publisher know that they really liked it but couldn't touch it. Whereas in Europe, and particularly in London and England, it's, you know, they, they love it. They talk about it all the time um, because they look over here, not to say that they don't have their own issues, but they look over in America and just go, what the fuck is going on over there? They, it doesn't make any sense to them. They're frankly embarrassed by it because if this is the apotheosis of Western civilization, <laughs> we're in trouble. Um, and it's, uh, they're just confused. Everyone, um, as I say in the book, the main character says, um, you know, uh, for him growing up, identity was uh, a prison. And now everyone's running around holding their handcuffs in the air and saying, look how special I am. Mm -hmm. And it's terrifying. Um, it's not going to end well. This is not, this is not the, the way to a happy ending. Um, and it's frankly, it's not even the way humanity has evolved. So um, I don't get too upset about it because I don't think that, that this is going to last. Um, uh, the reality of it is for anyone watching who doesn't want to believe this, I'm sorry, but the, the overwhelming odds are that our grandchildren, certainly our great grandchildren, are not going to be white and orthodox <laughs> and whatever we are. Uh, the world is moving toward uh, becoming one and that's a fantastic thing. We're just, some of us are just driving with the parking brake on, but that will change. Um, and that's all what we're seeing now. So um, yeah, I think if I had been um, on Twitter and uh, everything else at the moment, I wouldn't write this because the, 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 the fear of it or, the questioning of it will be too great, but I do think it's the artist's job to stay alone, uh, to, to bring out to the world their world view, and you can't do that when everyone's shouting in your ear. Yeah, no, and when you're, you know, we're all susceptible to basic human behavior and groupthink is part of kind of the human animal's basic tendency, you yeah. know? Oh. I mean, that's, you know, we don't want to be cast out, we don't want to be Auslanders. We want to belong, and, okay. and, it, and it belonging means, you know, 
insisting that we're all incredibly different forever and ever and ever and our power lies in our in our singularity then okay but yeah. how ironic is that yeah yeah i'm um i remember having uh in high school yeshiva high school uh, a rabbi who preached that um that we were supposed to live apart and that was human nature and animals don't uh, lions don't live with a deer mm -hmm. um you can imagine, I don't think it would be hard to figure out in that analogy who considers who he considers lions and who he considers deer. The goyim, uh, the Jew. Yeah, right. Um, uh, and in the end, he was uh, uh, he would go speak on this and became so uh, renowned for his uh, d you know defense of separatism that he would speak at white nationalist rallies. And they're like, oh, here's the great rabbi who, who agrees with us that we right. should all go apart and we should all. Um, and he he was, I remember being in his car once with four of my friends and he'd play music about, about you know, hang the nigger. And this is horrifying. And I remember having to get out of the car in the middle of in the middle of Washington Heights. <laughs> That's like, I'm like, no, you know what? I'm gonna take my chances with gangs um, because I suspect they have more ethics and morals than you do. But that's part. That's the problem. Is that you can't, you can't, you go down that road, and that's where that road leads. Right. And, right. You can't go halfway you know, down that road. It doesn't work. Right. Yes. right. And you know, the fantastic news is they're dying out. Those those creatures are dying out. Um, um, if you look at, go to any museum of natural history, yeah. they have on the walls. They have these maps of human migration and human travels across the earth over time. We all started out in the same place then kaboom we all split up and the narrative the story the third act is everyone coming back together in the end it's i hope you're right. right i hope you're right i love this passage on page eight uh in in mother for dinner when uh, seven seven seltzers the the hero of the book uh or the anti-hero if you please uh and his boss the publisher uh is explaining this to him you know we're a tribal creature. Division is the way of man. Uh, you know, we began in Africa as one, got the hell out as soon as we could, braving storms, oceans, beasts, famine. Why? Wanderlust? To see Paris in the springtime? No, because we couldn't stomach each other. It's just, uh, right. this, the, the, it's such a tour de force. You know, I, I, I'm just, I'm, I'm yeah, of course, you know, Seven's mother is on the other is in his other yeah. ear yeah. saying that cannibal Americans, uh, first of all, she hates the term because she's a proud cannibal, uh, are the greatest of all people. And Jews are the worst. Asians are no better. Don't get me started on black people. Um, and you know, I grew up around people like that. Me and, too, dude. You know, once you Dang. say, you know, once you say I'm number one, everyone else is number two. Right. And that's a problem. Um, and uh, one of the things that I really that, that came up in the book was that Seltzer's seventh father said to him when he was young um, that he has a different interpretation of um, love your neighbor as you love yourself. I figure I'll say this since we're being sponsored by a synagogue, um, and that his interpretation of it isn't um, in the same way that you love yourself, but as meaning when that when you're loving yourself love your neighbor because when you're loving yourself is the time you start hating everybody else right. um and it's a question about whether that's even possible um how do you do that how do you love yourself and love others because that dictum has become uh you know uh twisted as you know um uh in the same way that you love yourself but i don't know that that's possible and i think there's more to learn from it if it's at the time when you're loving yourself, remember to love your neighbors and not, not turn into this competition. This, I think it's yeah. very hard for us little human brains to hold more than one thought in our heads at the same time. We're not as smart as we like to think we are, with mm -hmm. the exception of you, maybe. You well, know? You know that, who was it who said it? Uh, I was just telling my son this. Um, I don't know. I want to say Emerson, but I'm probably wrong. Um, that comparison is the murderer of joy. Yeah. Right. Who was that? Do you know? It was a, it was a meme on Instagram. <laughs> right about about getting abs in six weeks. Mm -hmm. 
<laughs> I'm sure somehow it was it was denigrated, but um, it, it I brought it up with him in context of creating his own work, but um, it certainly is the case for society as well and a larger scheme. So one of the central struggles of this book and in, in a lot of your work, I, I think, um, is this this guilt, the guilt, the 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 sort of endless push pull of like, do I uphold the legacies uh, of the past? Do I subvert, abandon? Um, what what what's my responsibility? And and to whom am I responsible? Myself, my children, my forebears. Um, it's this impossible, impossible struggle that I right. I, I feel like you're exercising with with each work. Yeah, it is. Um... It is a struggle and Seventh goes through it. He doesn't know whether um, as, you know, as the last cannibal family, whether he should um, go ahead and do his mother's bidding, which is to consume her body after she dies or to walk away, to not continue this um, and to join, you know, the family of man as opposed to just the, the family of cannibals. So uh, I think that is a hard, it is a hard question and I think it's an even harder uh, ask. You and Seven uh, ultimately does both kind of. Um, he, he does and as he starts to um, do his mother's bidding he starts to go down that sinkhole of superiority and hatred and paranoia um, because once he decides that they're going to do it um, everyone else becomes the enemy. Everyone's trying to stop them. Everyone's uh, suspecting them of doing something wrong. Um, and ultimately he has to, they have to run. So um, it's not something I've, you know, determined for myself. I do think that, um, you know, if, the, if, if it's true that nothing worthwhile is easy, um, to me, it seems very easy. It would be very easy for me to, um, continue everything I was taught. Mm -hmm. It would be very easy to, to tell my kids to wear yarmulkes and go to, go to shul on Shabbos and that on Yom Kippur, God judges you. That would be very easy. Um, it, it's much more difficult to, to leave things behind, to say, what's the, what's, the greater, what's the greater good here for this planet? Not for me and not for my family and not for Muncie, New York and not for Jews, but for mankind. Uh, I, I don't think it's an easy thing to do, but I do think that that's, that's the challenge is, you know, we picture that we're going to go through life and get up to heaven and God's going to go good for you for keeping that chain going. Mm -hmm. But it's also very possible that you get up there and you pat yourself on the back and you say, look what I did, God. And he says, you fool, mm -hmm. you coward. You did exactly what they told you to. That's not what I was, that's not what you were there for. And yet, as you struggle with these things, creatively, personally, psychically, like you're still in conversation with this God. Yeah. You, know, you can spare your children this and their children maybe, but you're, you're caught in that web forever, no matter what. Well, those are two different things though. I mean, I am for sure. There's no doubt about that. And everything uh, I've been working on even at, at, since Mother for Dinner is part of that. But I don't think that the God question is a Jewish question. Because I don't relate to him in those ways, I, you know. I, I don't know what we're doing here, and why we got here. And there's probably no such being. Um, I think we probably are better creatures for not knowing. And again, it's a similar type of thing. I think the challenge, the easy thing, would be to decide: yes, there is, or I'm going to go Dawkins and say no, there isn't. Uh, I think I think question marks are sometimes good. Well, okay. and yeah, and, and beware anybody who tells you that they know. I mean, that's creepy. Right. Well, that's the thing, right? And you say, oh, I'm agnostic. They just say, oh, you're you're just afraid to make a decision. I'm like, no, that is the decision. That's all there is. But an atheist is like the most religious person in the world. Uh, yeah. The certainty I mean, is like, that's right. weird. I mean, Socrates, you know, all I know is that I know nothing. He was an agnostic. He was asking questions right up to the moment he died. So that's also a hard thing. It's like sometimes I just feel like we give ourselves credit for doing easy things by saying they're hard to hurt choices when they're actually the easiest choice. 
And so, yeah, so I do, I struggle with this character, with this uh, uh, existence, like well, what's before, what's after, um, probably nothing and probably nobody cares, but um, certainly seems odd that um, we haven't found others living on the next planet over, I don't know. Uh, maybe there's a reason for it. Um, love certainly seems to be a good, a good reason to believe in something higher, but then maybe not. Um, uh, I, I, I dread that moment, that moment where the heart stops and everything is over and it all goes black because for a split second, you're going to have to wait and find out. And then either there's going to be that, uh, you know, the tunnel with light and I'm going to go, oh, fuck, or it's just blackness. Um, and all of this was for naught. Um, I don't know which way it goes, but I don't think those are uh, Catholic questions or Protestant questions or Jewish questions. That's that's just mankind. Amen. Again, like we might do better answering some of these questions if we didn't, uh, you know, argue over who's wearing the right hat. Or if if we maybe try to do our best to make here and now as good as possible for as many people as possible, and like let that be just the work of being here sure. instead of arguing sure. over who's better and who's worse and who's had it worse and who's you know doing yeah. what. Um, so I was thinking a lot when I was reading this book about about uh, Hamlet, you know, uh, and to be or not to be, and 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 in, as I look around the world and as I you know keep sort of a fraction of an ear close to the ground on the platforms uh, of, of hell. Um, it's more like to be a fill in the blank or not to be. That is the question, you know, like, and I found myself, I, I'm sure you're immune to this because you are much more spiritually advanced than I am. I think, you know, just having known you for many years and been in conversation with you um, but I found myself since, you know, the sort of rise in popularity of fascism in the last, you know, five, six years, not that fascism ever went anywhere, uh, but maybe it was hibernating a little, uh, and then it, it, you know, it's, it's, it's back and, um, and the reaction to it is just as fascist and, you know, it's, it's a, it's a, we're in a, we're in a clusterfuck and it's not gonna end well. Um, but I found myself like clinging more to like whatever scraps of identity I can lay claim to, you know, sure. um, suddenly it's like, it's like, well, you know, if I'm, if I'm not queer and if I'm not a big old Jew with a capital J, uh, and if that's not right out in front, then like, I guess I'm not, you know, worth right. hearing. Um, and, and that right. instinct in, it has been a really frightening right. thing that's, to get into myself. Sorry. But that's 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 not a defensive identity. That's a that's a that's a problem with fascism. <laughs> right. Well, and it, like so, it, you know, fascism outside gives rise to fascism inside. Like there's, yeah. you know, we're all yeah. connected. We're all we're all one. Um, yeah. um, uh, and at the same time, I look around at some of these things and I go, oh, "Shit, this is my fault." Not for being a Jew, but for being like an easy '90s liberal. <laughs> You know, like, like, you know, saying all the right things and being woke in the 90s and all of a sudden, um, if you say anything, you're done. Um, right, and so this canceled. is your fault. You started. And, and there's, yeah, of course, I'm a, I feel guilty for everything. Um, but, um, but again, that, that just points to the, the, the problem, not the solution, right? So, um, you know, I, 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 I remember really, really, really being proud of uh, America and Obama as a person when he won. Um, and, you know, I can look back and go, not not the most effective of presidents, but certainly a good figurehead. And um, I can look at him, but I remember going at the time, going, oh, this is so great. And then the camera falls back a bit from his face as he's talking and there on his lapel is the American flag. And I'm like, I was with you right up until that point. Like, right, I was with you, I'm, I'm down, I'm down with the Hulk thing, I'm down with change, I'm down with, you know, uh, perfect is the enemy of the good, and let's all get together and be the change. And then America's number one, like that doesn't fit. Like, I, to me, we got to get rid of all this stuff. Like, I'm not looking for like small change. I'm not looking to get like a certain book off the shelf. I'm saying uh, to me, like, until we get rid of this, these nations and these, 
artificial borders that we you know made thousands of years ago for understandable reasons uh, we're doomed we're doomed and so when i see a great thinker or somebody i think whose heart is in the right place and then they go and hug the american flag i'm just like oh yeah that's not gonna, that's not gonna end well right. um i don't i don't trust flags i think flags are a problem a yeah. big problem of any kind uh american russian uh, gay straight Black lives matter. Black lives don't matter. I don't know whoever, whatever they're wearing. I, I see so many flags nowadays. I don't know what they even mean anymore. There are so many. And my son will go, look at that on the back of that pickup truck. I'm like, what is that? That's a flag. Do yeah. I agree with that? Do I not That's agree with thing. that? I'm really like, what am I, what am I supposed to feel? Uh, one's, I don't know. What is, what is that? It's right. like, right. Um, either and, yay, I'm with you or like, fuck you. I hope you die. Like, you know, yeah, it's let me quickly decide. And, and it's, I don't, I don't know. I, I don't care. That's not going to fix anything. Um, I don't like the person in the car immediately. Um, you know, I, it's pie in the sky, but you know, that's, that's gotta be the, that's gotta be the goal is, you know, when you see, um, you know, I was reading this really interesting thing, um, uh, by, uh, uh, I think it was by Alan de Botton or somebody, but they were talking about the media and um, how when they go and what they should really be doing in places like uh, the West Bank or Africa or wherever, which is they go and they show you pictures of bombed out roads and uh, exploded buildings and uh, trash filling rivers. And they say, isn't this horrible? We should do something. And what ends up happening is we look at that and we go, well, that's not us. And in fact, that's so far from us, uh, I give up. I, I don't even feel empathy because I, I don't know what the fuck is going on over there. Uh, the whole place is a giant tire fire. I, I, I have no idea. And then in the context of that article, they showed these photographers from those places, uh, not, not journalists, but just photographers, mm -hmm. who would take photos of you know, three, girl, three Palestinian school girls, teenage girls getting dressed for a dance, a school dance in their tiny room. And not to make it miserable and not to show how they live in poverty, just to, they're, they're us, mm -hmm. they're, they're people. Um, these people that you're bombing are people, these people in Iran that we wanna go you know, to war, they're walking around in Nikes and, and Prada. Like at the, at the very least, can't we look at major brands and, and coalesce around, <laughs> coalesce around Starbucks. brands? <laughs> And you go, wow, when do we just stop and just, well, and just we say we're, we're individuals, we're people. This is so beyond. I guess I just grew up um, being told to hate and being hated at the same time. Well, right. And having your and having like being hatred is part of the identity. So it's like, don't, you know, don't don't fall for any of this, you know, Mumbo yeah. jumbo because everybody hates you. Remember that yeah, everybody. Hates you. I, I, I was friendly with uh, the African American kids on my block, and the things my family or parents would say about them, I you know I'll get canceled if I repeat. And I say, how dare you? you know, even as a, even as a ten year old, I'd be like, oh, isn't that what caused the Holocaust? How can you say that? And then I go up and I go play with them, and they have little friends over from that I haven't met before, and they start shooting BBs at me because I'm a Jew boy. And you're just like, okay, I don't know where that where I'm supposed to be, but I do know that that both sides of this argument are wrong. Um, you know, um, I remember hilariously as a kid, me and my friends uh, on Shabbos one day were bored, and so uh, there was a golf course nearby, and we decided to walk over to the golf course, and with our yarmulkes and sitsis out, and we're walking around and. A bunch of these white guys with golf clubs start smacking balls at us, They're trying to hit us. And we're like, holy shit, this is crazy. I can't believe this. It's, you know, it's 1980 in America. And we run home and I tell my mother and she says, there's goddamn anti-Semites, you know, there's Nazis. They're going to hear it from me. And we walked back and she asked to speak to the manager. And she said, those men were hitting golf balls at four little boys because they were wearing yarmulkes and had tits on right over there. And he goes, they were hitting balls at them because that's the driving range. <laughs> <laughs> I'm very sorry. They probably should have stopped, but maybe they didn't see them. But I don't think it was a Nazi attack. It's not Kristallnacht. It's just a driving range. 
<laughs> and uh, it's, it's, but you get that in your head, right? And so if they're hitting balls at me, I'm going to go hit balls at them. And trust me, we were like, we weren't like scared little Jewish because we were in the parking lot. We we're like, let's go fuck up their cars. Let's go scratch their, their, their Mercedes. Like we're going to go get, get back some. And can you imagine if like that had been the next step? And then like, now it's all of a sudden it's escalated to this ridiculous degree because some kids strolled onto a driving range but had been trained to think, you know, blah. Even tonight, even today, I'm not so sure those guys weren't aiming for the little Jew boys. Like, I, I, even now, I'm like, oh, maybe, maybe. I would have seen, I would have seen a kid. Because, like, uh, what is that? Like, what that feeling that you get when you're righteously victimized, like, that feeling, like, there's some, it's perversely it's called, empowering. It's called Instagram. Wow. Yeah. It's Facebook. Yeah. It's Facebook. You know this thing next door is? Have you ever heard of this thing? No. Okay, so I'm I moved to LA a few years ago because I'm a schmuck, and to uh, to to get accustomed to the place, there's this thing called Next Door, which is a website that you you send in your zip code, and they you know they confirm that you live in the area, and then you you get to meet your neighbors. And the idea is, oh, I have a table for sale, or right. oh, I'm new to the neighborhood. Where's a good coffee shop? Right. What it really ends up being is. Um, lots of terrified people wanting to know why there's a black guy on their front yard so or has anyone seen my dog so i just call it lost dog found black man and people on it don't particularly like that but that's what it is and it's like that's okay if if we're gonna look at what the digital version of a next door is that's it it's living in terror everyone's shouting at each other and hating each other but then you and, and i'm like i remember looking at it going what the I was like, oh, we got to move. I don't know what, where we, this place is crazy. Santa and Monica. Outside and people wait and they say, hi, oh, how you doing? And the neighbor comes over and says, oh, did you just move in? Nice to meet you. Um, blah, blah, blah. I'm Syrian. Oh, I'm, uh, we're from New York. I'm, my wife's British. Oh, oh, it's a sunny day. Look at the beach. Oh, oh, the, the two worlds are just crazy. And it's a pretty decent um, analog or metaphor for the way I was raised, which was, you know, you're told about hatred and hatred and hatred and to hate, to hate, to hate. And then you go outside and, you know, people are just getting on with their lives. Right. Um, and they've been told, you know, the Irish Catholics in Mun live next door to Muncie were told everyone hated them. And the African-Americans were told everyone hated them. And they all lived in their own little communities, hating and being hated. And some point, someone's got to say, OK, this this can't be right. This This is not the way forward. What did Baldwin say? There's a great line I always loved. I mean, I loved it in high school because it spoke to my like adolescent pain, but it's much more resonant. Oh yeah, uh, coffee, coffee is for closers. <laughs> no, <laughs> no, it's uh, it's uh, people cling so stubbornly to their hate because they sense that once hate is gone, they'll be forced to deal with pain. Yeah, yeah. Who wants uh, to deal with pain? Yeah. Um, I don't know. I don't know. I think it's. Um, I think it's it's close to that title, that Hedges book, right? War is the is the force that gives our life meaning. Um, and if you don't have, uh, but you can fight for something that isn't fighting. You can fight about not fighting. You can fight for getting along. You can say, you know, someone remember somebody saying to me, oh, it's a it's a it's a travesty. It's it's a horror that your that your children don't keep Shabbos. Okay, I actually think it's a step in the right direction. That's just, that's my point of view. That's, I think that that's important. I think if, if for every one kid who doesn't keep Shabbos, a, a Catholic kid doesn't keep Easter and a Muslim kid doesn't keep Ramadan, well, that's three kids working in the right direction. Well, yeah. And, you know, then, you know, on, onto the feed pops up like a little like, hey, scientists now believe that a day of rest cuts heart attack and stroke in half over a lifetime, you know? So like, there are some like vestiges of useful, helpful, so kind of seasonal celebrations, yeah. communal life, so rest. a day of rest. Like these, so are, rest. these so are, rest. are good ideas. So rest. Right. Someone said like, to me, uh, oh, uh, but we love, uh, we love this mirrors. Okay, so sing them. Right. Go to the Philharmonic. They have some great songs. Right. Uh, I'm taking my son to System of a Down next month. That's all. <laughs> Honestly, like I don't, it doesn't, it, it, it's not a defense of, of tribalism. 
I haven't heard a good defense of tribalism. I've heard, yeah, you know what? They found in studies that uh, uh, prayer uh, helps heal people. Right. Okay. That's not right. because you went to the Wailing Wall and stuck a note in it. That's because hope releases endorphins and gives your body blah, blah, blah. And we can achieve all that without it, right? Yeah. Um, so it, it's, it's, none of those things are defenses of anything. It's not to say, I'm not in that world of people where like, we got nothing from religion but hatred and blah, blah. on the contrary. Great music, some great art, if it's a little uh, sadomasochistically homosexual, but <laughs> still some of it was interesting. Um, and uh, I think, you know, some great things come from it. Right. But that was embryonic. You know, we needed religion. I, I, people who say that you know religion gave us morality are absolute fools. Morality gave us religion, and where we've passed the point now where we need religion to do these things. We should be smart enough. We should be aware enough. We should be as one enough to be able to go. Okay, thanks, religion. You got us past the adolescent stage of humanity. Uh, just like believing in Santa Claus did when we were little kids, uh, but we don't need you anymore, right? We can we can take all the good and not 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 denigrate what was done, and not not get rid of spirituality and all that other stuff, but just get rid of the shit. The shit you better watch out, about. dude. You're gonna wind up nailed to a cross. I'm I'm a little worried for you. Well, our people have a long tradition of that. <laughs> Go Jews. I think I think you are perversely one of the more optimistic people I know, which is yeah, me in a lot of trouble. Yeah, that's why I, I'm on Prozac. <laughs> well, that's a story for another. Prozac time. isn't Prozac isn't for depressed people. Depressed people are depressed because they're hopeful. But um, right. yeah, I'm not saying that you know I want to walk outside and hug everybody who walks past me. Uh, I'm just all I can do is say, okay, I was this was the this was the amount of time in the history of humankind that I was here for. Mm -hmm. And this is what I saw. And this is what worked. And this is what didn't work. And this is what was painful. And this is what was beautiful. And this is what was joyous. And this is what brought tears. Drop the mic and leave, right? So that's, that's all I can do. I'm not a particularly good woodworker. I can't fix engines. I'm, I'm, I'm pretty good at that and um, some people may hate me for it. Some people might like me for it, but that's the job. And that's part of the reason why it's sort of like, you know, and I talk about this with my wife who writes and does artwork as well, that there's, there's a certain monk-like existence um, that I think uh, artists have to uh, take on. Um, it's, it is being alone a lot. It is just trying to hear the voices in your head that everybody else is drowning out with AirPods and headphones and noise, um, anything they can do, TV, movie, anything they can do to not have to hear their own voice. And I'd love to do that, but my sort of role, my job, my only ability is listening to that voice and putting it down uh, somehow on paper, on a video, whatever. Um, and if in a thousand years, uh, it's, if there still is a thousand years, uh, uh, I'm a fool, then they can, uh, you know, they can laugh at me. But other than other, that, doesn't really have any effect on whether I'm going to say what I have to say. And history doesn't really bear that out. You know, the people who could sit quietly in a sort of a spiritual communion with the inner voice and and selflessly find a way to deliver that to other people who want to hear it, like those yeah. are those are not the people we revile. Right, right. Um, Revere, yeah. I mean, look, I, it's hard. I got into an argument with one of my closest friends last week, just last week, because he just sent me a link. My email says clearly, do not I know. send any links. I, I don't know. know. I'm in the know. No nothing. No memes, no links, nothing. And he just texted me something about someone we knew who was a hideous human being and therefore doing very well in corporate America. <laughs> and it made me angry. It put me in a bad mood for like an hour. And I'm like, dude, don't you know not to do this? This is not a joke, you know? And he made some joke like to get out of it. I'm like, okay, I understand, but please, like, you know, I'm not asking much, but don't bring a pig into this temple, <laughs> you know? And this being tweets, the temple. And tweets and links and news are pigs. Right. You know, um, uh, I was having this talk with him and I have with you a bunch about not listening and well, 
what I was supposed to know. And I was like, you know, that old expression, don't kill the messenger. That was when there was like one messenger. <laughs> like now there are 10,000 messengers crawling all over your house. They're in the basement. They're eating at the foundation of your home. Kill them. <laughs> They're called termites. It's time to kill them. I get it. They're just messengers, but that's, I'm not some king sitting around getting a message a day. So where do you get your validation if not from little hearts and <laughs> likes? Um, um, mostly hardcore pornography. Uh, no. Um, you know what? Honestly, from uh, the work itself, you know, I, it makes me laugh. If I write a sentence, I go home and I feel pretty good about myself. I look at my kids. I have a great family, I have great children, we're very close. Um, they're super cool, they're 10 times smarter than me, so they're always putting me on the straight and narrow. And I have a, I have a 30 year long marriage to somebody who's um, uh, first of all hot, and second of all <laughs> just in this with me. We're on the same journey together. So um, the reality is when I go looking for validation, I end up being incredibly depressed. Yeah. When I go looking for Amazon reviews or uh, newspaper quotes or whatever, that's when I get most uh, killy, stabby. I really like how Seventh, I don't want to give away the ending here, but Seventh ends up writing uh, a book about his, his journey, his hero slash anti-hero's journey, uh, and it's published uh, and in, uh, doesn't doesn't do well. It's largely ignored. Because <laughs> <laughs> uh, its hero was a man who let his people disappear into history, who chose to define himself by what he and his fellow man had in common rather than by what made them different. Yeah, no sales. And the reviews, the reviews are, are, are pretty awesome. <laughs> and then the reviewers, you know, fighting with each other and insulting each other. Right. Uh, it's, uh, yeah. <laughs> you know, the assholes continue this for as long as assholes continue these things. Uh, and then how about, how about the delicious factoid about uh, fetal development? <laughs> yeah, that was one of those things um, uh, 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 that I, I, I read years ago and it was like, you know, you're a writer, you just go, okay, somewhere, somewhere that's, I'm using that. Um, <laughs> And it was this this thing. I forget the terms now um, because, like you know, again, as a writer, once you once you use the thing, you, you throw it out forever because it's a, no more use to me. But uh, seventh um, uh, brother, uh, well, his sister Zero, who's named Zero because she doesn't count. They're all named numbers, <laughs> um, but because it's a patrilineal culture, girls don't count. So uh, the mother named her Zero because she was very upset to have a girl. Well, Zero points out. Uh, to seven that um, that uh, humans are there are two types of creatures uh, fetally speaking mm -hmm. and this goes true for every the smallest bacteria up to us and they fall into two groups and those two groups are defined by what feature what, what part of our anatomy develops first and one group the mouth develop first the other group the anus develops first and humans are anus first. Um, and her point is, we're all just a bunch of assholes. And if we could just embrace that and accept that and not have to be the biggest or the best or number one, or the one with the more bombs or the one who has this, who, you know, occupies this place. If we just accept that we're all assholes, maybe we could make some progress. And Seventh, who sort of based his entire life on the philosophy of Montaigne, decides that's the wisest thing he's ever heard. Mm -hmm. And in fact, um, Montaigne take, shows up in the book a lot because of that. And Montaigne did this lifelong process of writing essays and examining himself in a room, right? White privilege. And um, uh, ended up concluding at the very end that no matter what, that even the highest king you have to remember, even the highest king sits upon the throne on his ass. Right. That's where he ended up. <laughs> that's, that's, that's where Buddha ended up. That's where everybody ends up who's thought about this long enough is we ain't that great. All our shit stinks. And maybe that's, maybe that's a good thing. Maybe that's something we should all recognize. That's a know? good starting point. Assholes yeah. from the moment we form. Yes. Yeah. 
Yeah, and there are creatures that aren't. <laughs> what, what are those creatures? I forget. I don't know. I'm assuming dogs, since they're better than people. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> <laughs> no, something microscopic that hasn't that hasn't moved on. Apparently, in this world, if you develop your anus first, you're in better shape. You you get farther. Yeah. Yeah. So we yeah. thought it was opposable thumbs, but really it's anus first and then you Right. And in fact, it's like easier if a, for a doctor, like if a baby is born without an eye or without even, you know, breathing tube, they can do stuff. If a baby's born without an asshole, they're in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> I think <laughs> I think Solomon said that. I think that was in that was in uh, Ecclesiastes. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Um, do you ever do you ever wish or did you ever wish when you were younger or like starting out, did you ever just wish that you could be normal and complacent and be satisfied with the same shit that everyone else is satisfied with? Yeah, of course. I mean, I wanted to be Menudo for a long time. Nice. <laughs> I thought that guy from Menudo had it made when I was a kid. Um, I don't know what that means. I, I, I don't know. I don't know what normal means. I don't think anybody is. Some people uh, work really hard at pretending. Yeah, I don't know why. I don't know what they're, where they're getting that framework. Like, I don't even know how to begin doing that. It seems really painful and lonely. I see the stuff. I see my kids show me the, the Instagram feeds of these kids, uh, you know, desperately trying to brand themselves. I, <clears throat> uh, it's the triumph of advertising, I suspect, or marketing, but um, it's everyone has to, you know, everyone has to fit into the same mold. I, I don't, I don't even know where that, I mean, I guess that's tribalistic at some level, but right. um, because the weird ones get left out, but um, I don't know. I, you know, um, all the people I always liked were weird. So it didn't bother me. Do you know what I mean? I was always, whether it was people I was reading who I was told not to read or comedians who I was told not to listen to or musicians who I was told to turn off, like they were all weirdos. So, uh, I never, and, and then, you know, you always found out the guy in town who's in the most respected in shul, um, you know, got arrested with kitty porn. <laughs> There's no such thing. So, um, uh, you know, it's not a question of let your freak flag fly or some other meme, but I do think it's, uh, it, the quicker you realize that no one's normal, the better off you'll be. That's what I teach my kids. There ain't no normal, there's you. And, and that's you're, like, the only, you're the only you there is and everybody hates you, so you better hate everybody else. Right, so get a gun and run away to Israel. Right. Um, what are you working on? What, what's, what's, on your, what's on deck for you right now? Um, I'm working on a, a, a novel that um, is making me laugh a lot. Um, two, actually. And um, another memoir. And then... Um, in about a week, I'm gonna put up some videos that I've been making over, it's like what I did over COVID um, called Ungodly. I'm just posting them up to um, to YouTube. There's, there's eventually there'll be hundreds of them. Right now, there's, I'm starting with the 10 that I've made, but it's a, um, it's sort of like a, uh, it's taking upon the, the, the concept of what if we've got it all wrong with the Bible? What if God is the character in the story we're not supposed to be like? And we've been emulating, you know, Jack and the Shining. And so it's basically going, you know, chapter and verse uh, with different interpretations of what we might learn, what might we learn from Adam and Eve if God is actually the bad guy, right? So what we learn from it now is we're sinners and we can't be trusted and we get our asses thrown out. But what if the lesson is really um, don't get so hung up on your possessions like God does? <laughs> you know what I mean? Like there's just really, and, and it was one of these things that came to me probably 15 years ago. I was super high and I was like, wait, maybe we got the story wrong. You know, maybe we're all like, like, like saying this, the wicked stepmother is the hero of the story when she's not, she's the villain. What if God's the antagonist? Um, and so it takes God as the antagonist into each chapter, into each you know, chapter and verse and tries to find a new lesson um, looking at it from that perspective. And I have to say, um, it may have come from weed, but it's actually very convincing. You kind of look at it and go, wait, you know, we could learn such better lessons 
you know, if it's when the guy says, you know, slaughter all the uh, Amalekis in your midst, if that was a bad thing, <laughs> if we all sat around and said, kids, don't do that. Genocide bad. Like, oh, maybe that, when did that lesson, we, when we missed that lesson, if we think that he's, if he's always right, if he is always good. Um, the Greeks have had something going there with fucked up gods. There was something wise about that. It's going to be really so. ironic if you end up forming the curriculum for like a next generation of religious education. <laughs> it's going to be a real. <laughs> well, I've been in a lot of talks with Islamic Jihad and they're, we were working on that. <laughs> Um, any, <laughs> Their people are talking to my people. Any anyone uh, want to type any questions? Uh, go ahead. You have access to this great mind here <laughs> for another few minutes. Um, yeah. Before I go out into the streets of LA and like totally give up on mankind completely. Wow, man, LA. We we switch places. Yeah. I, I live in upstate New York. You live in LA. Yeah, um, I'll, I won't, I'll never forget my second or third day here. I, uh, I, I was walking down the street wondering why I got here. And um, I had the perfect LA moment, which was uh, a CrossFit gym on Wilshire is in a small space. And so part of their workout routine is to have everybody walk outside holding kettlebells over their heads, heavy kettlebells, and walk up and down the sidewalk for like 10 minutes. And it's all very fit, uh, you know, Caucasians, let's be honest. And um, as they're doing this, and, and you know, and he's cheering them on, you got this, you got this, and they're, <laughs> uh, and they're walking down Wilshire, walking up Wilshire, right through them, is this sort of emaciated homeless guy with a giant bag of like everything in the world over his shoulder, walking right past them as they're walking by with their weights. And it was just like, God damn. <laughs> that's, a good, that's a good workout, carrying yeah. all your sessions. Oh my <laughs> God, I was just like, oh, that's just the world in a nutshell. And that's a lousy nut. Wherever you go, there you are. Yeah. Um, okay, Julie Holland, Dr. Julie Holland, everybody. Another, another brilliant, Jem uh, wants to know if you have given up on TV, Shalom. Oh, as a career? Um, yeah. Not I, mean, a, I, I, really, I, not I never, I never, I don't really watch it, but um, uh, I, I, you know, the way I find, I've come to realize that, that um, while there's some good opportunities for um, expression in TV and film, I don't think, they, they, I, I just don't think they rise to the, for me to the level of what words on a page can do. Um, uh, there's just something about a line break for me. <laughs> you know? um, uh, the way a word looks, I, I don't, I don't. And um, frankly, I can sit, we can get off this call and I can sit here and I can write something and I don't have to pitch it. Mm -hmm. And I don't have to worry about which quadrant it goes to and will men and women like it and what about kids? and who's gonna star. And if we can't get a star, we really, I just, you know, I'm 50. I only got like maybe, you know, if I'm lucky, 30 writing years left. I, I, can't, I can't waste it in an office at CAA debating who's gonna do the lead role. Um, so uh, I, I haven't given up on it. It's just not worth it to me. In the, in the, in the scheme of things, it's just not worth it. Let them like come to you, take something you've written, and go squabble about who's going to star in it themselves. And they can, but they won't because I don't write about zombies and vampires and superheroes. And um, it's sad. I, if if this were the '70s, you know, or there was some sort of underground, you know, there are people I love who made small. I loved Hal Hartley. I, I mean, there were some really great small filmmakers that were very influential to me when I was a teenager, you know, in New York City, going to Kim's video and finding all these interesting people. But it just doesn't exist. And I, it's not worth it for me. And well, even, you're putting it on YouTube. So that's kind of the postmodern equivalent, right? Yeah, and it's it's not, I'm not filming it. It's mm -hmm. all, you know, creative, you know, you, you know, fair use and creative commons. And mm -hmm. I just sit in this room with a mic and record my voice. I don't, I, I can make it and do it tomorrow. So uh, even if it were something that I'd want to do, uh, it's, just, it's just too difficult. Like, right. you know, I can create a character and cast them, 
but I can't, with film and TV, you're always at the whim of who shows up, who does it, who's the right person for it, who's not the right person for it. Um, and if you get the wrong person, uh, it doesn't work. Um, and there's not a lot of good people. There's not a lot of good actors. There's not a lot of good, there's not a lot of good anybody's, but specifically in that world, it's uh, less and less people to actually know the craft of it and can actually do it. Um, Perhaps, you know, it might be that I started the first actor I actually worked with was uh, Philip Seymour Hoffman, and maybe that is what put me off everybody else because he was the real deal. And there was something incredibly broken about him, but also incredibly uh, odd watching him become a character and watching him work. And after that, I can't, everybody I could, I, I just, I don't know, I, I don't, I don't feel the same way. Are we ever going to get to see that pilot that he shot ever in this? Um, I know, um, I know John, uh, John Cameron Mitchell, who was the director, put it up on YouTube on he his did? page for a little bit. And then Showtime went and ordered it, you know, cease and desist it. I don't know why. Um, um, uh, it's certainly worth watching. <laughs> um, and, uh, I can't bring myself to watch it just because I really love the guy. And, um, but uh, yeah, I was happy John put it up, but then they took it down. It'll get out there eventually. It, everything does. There's, you know, I'm sure the, that'll come out around the same time as Trump with the hookers and Russia. I don't know, but everything gets out eventually. Um, Ed Schwartzchild would like to know what you miss most about upstate New York. Um, ticks. No, um, actually solitude. Yeah. Yeah. Solitude and friends, you know, I don't find that, um, uh, it's really hard here to find people who are not, um, I don't know, assholes, you know. Ponies. Yeah, everyone just, everyone's working, everyone's working something. And I don't know that that's LA. I think it's just city. I don't think I'm a city person. I mm -hmm. think if I go, if I'd gone to New York, I'd be even more, uh, suffocating. I just don't think, there was a time in my life where I was, I just think right now, even a small city um, would probably drive me bananas. Um, I think Albany would work for you. Maybe, but I still feel like I don't want to walk out of my house and see somebody. Yeah, I feel that you know too. I mean? yeah. Um, oh yeah. Uh, and I, that's part of the problem. I think, I just think I'm beyond city right now. And I love it for like, you know, and it's not the typical LA stuff. Like I was surprised I'm in LA and like, honestly, best independent bookstores anywhere, yeah. anywhere, crushes New York. Yeah. And independent, cool bookstores, like, wow, cool little theaters doing stuff. I don't mean movie theaters. I'm like actual people on stage yeah. doing interesting things. So I'm not like, oh, it's a cultural wasteland at all. Uh, I just don't think I, I, I'm not a city, city creature. All right. Well, I think that we have done our job here. Okay. And now we can say farewell. Thank you so much for your time. Um, well, thank you. Thanks for doing it. It's fun. Nice um, to have my first day in my office. Uh, <laughs> see you here. It's an awesome looking office. I hope you get great work done there for all of our sakes, selfishly. Uh, you're, the, you're the goat and I am your biggest fan. Thank you. Yeah, the goat they push off the cliff. That goat. <laughs> <laughs> no, my son told me this. It's the greatest of all time. Yes, yes. yes. I remember I told my son for his bar mitzvah. I was, uh, I was taking him to see the a goat. For, I got him a goat for his bar mitzvah, and we didn't celebrate it, but we went to the garden and watched LeBron James play the Knicks. Nice. That was his bar mitzvah. I love it. Yeah. Oh my god, you are the goat. You are. All, All right. right. Looks like uh, this is going to go. The video of this is going to go up on YouTube. So um, tell your fans, uh, mm. send them a link. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. See, subscribe, some of us, subscribe, hit the like button. Some of us know. are on. I'm on Facebook for you. I'm just yeah, shilling you, you on Facebook. Thank so you. I you're suffer. My, you're my street um, whore. Yeah. Yeah, that's what I am. Um, Julie Holland says, I'm your biggest fan. So we're going to have a little fight about that. Thank you, um, Julie. Live and be well. You're the shit. Thanks. Yeah. I give you prayer hands. It's my oh, wow, look at that. Namaste to you. Is that Sorry. good? Yeah.